It's a great pleasure to be here. All the more so because uh, today is Marx's 200th birth anniversary. And what follows is inspired and dedicated to Marx, and particularly to the third and 11th Feuerbach thesis, namely, the educator must be educated. And the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. Um, I have a very indisciplined relation to words. I, um, for example, uh, wrote my PhD on silence, 360 words, uh, 360 pages, not just words. Um, talk about performative contradictions. So we philosophers not only like to talk, but we really love to talk. Um, and so without much uh, ado, I'm going to jump into my talk. Uh, the first section is called One World, One Pain, question mark. Now, in recent years, an increasing number of global citizens' movements have taken justice as their explicit goal. At issue here are the scope and scale of struggles for justice. In contrast to those who committed to domestic justice contribute to the well-being of their immediate communities and fellow citizens, theorists and activists in the field of transnational justice argue for a broader and deeper commitment that would encompass strangers both within and beyond straight borders. They argue that in a globalized world, our duties and responsibilities are not limited to our fellow citizens. A concurrent effort is to emphasize the economic, political, cultural, and sexual aspects of injustice. Uh, it is argued that the increasing scale and velocity of economic, cultural, and technological connectivity, along with the speed of global flows of capital, commodities, peoples, and ideas, have led some to claim that a profoundly new global condition has emerged. Challenging imperialist globalization lies at the heart of counter-hegemonic movements that focus on human rights and on the, uh, um, on the inequitable distribution of resources, as well as politics of recognition and representation in order to ensure that all members of world society have equal opportunities and parity of participation. From a feminist perspective, the engagement with gender justice involves intersectional, but also transnational focus, and also critique of global sisterhood. Now, distinguished scholars like Martha Nussbaum and Ulrich Beck argue that contemporary cosmopolitanism facilitates new alliances across state borders, regions, and even continents, thereby contesting narrow group loyalties and nationalism. In an increasingly globalized world, the lives of people who have never met and who most probably will never meet are nonetheless intimately connected. This animates us to rethink our politics in a globalized world in the face of eroding state legitimacy. Now, a quick, quick footnote here um, on the notion of cosmopolitanism. Now, this was first advanced by the founding father of the cynic movement, Diogenes. When, he, when Diogenes was asked where he comes from, he, in a very, very you know, grand claim, um, made the remark, I am a citizen of the world. And it's very well known that what Diogenes was trying to do was shame Plato. So he was saying, you know, when you think of demos, when you think of polis, you can only think of Athens. Yeah, because you are somebody who's like a little frog in the well. I have traveled outside Athens. And I consider, when I think about demos and polis, myself to be a citizen of the world. Now, this is considered to be a ground-breaking uh, bre moment in intellectual history, for until then, issues of political consciousness were limited to individual city-states. Uh, the aim is to expand one's understanding of belonging and to finally encompass all of humanity. Now, taking inspiration from Greek thinkers, philosophers of European Enlightenment augmented the importance of this sentiment in their political and ethical theories. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, for example, professed that cosmopolites are people who are nowhere strangers and are able to cross imaginary boundaries that separate peoples and embrace the whole of mankind in their benevolence. In, now I'm going to jump a few centuries. In her book, Cultivating Humanity, Martha Nussbaum writes, and I quote her, the world around us is inescapably international. Issues from business to agriculture, from human rights to the relief of famine, call our imaginations to venture beyond narrow group loyalties and to consider the reality uh, or realities of distant lives. Cultivating our humanity in a complex interlocking world involves understanding the ways in which common needs, 
and aims are differently realized in different circumstances. The emphasis here is on the urgency of acting in the face of suffering of others. It is overcoming apathy and indifference by realizing that we are not immune to the pain of others. One is frequently encountering, um, or nowadays we are flooded with images and narratives of destruction, and many speak um, of empathy fatigue. You know, they're saying one feels so overwhelmed with these images, you have the feeling you can't help everybody. And um, the question is whether politics, whether ethic, uh, whether, sorry, art and media can facilitate solidarity and compassion and ethics, or are we witnessing a neoliberal appropriation of affective agency? There was a very, very interesting discussion yesterday in one of the panels on this topic. So I'd like to share with you all a couple of examples of this dilemma of what to do uh, with the pain of others, with the suffering of others. So the first example is from this um, 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 artist, Martha Rossler, and in her series of uh, artworks called How's Beautiful, Bringing the War Home, what we see are um, happy American families enjoying suburban bliss, even as we see bloodshed and chaos in the background. And Rossler, uh, when she discusses her work, talks about how she wants to comment on the oblivious of Americans um, not only to the current wars in Iraq, but also to the historical wars um, in Vietnam. And um, what you see are these you know, smiling faces uh, who completely seem to be oblivious to the pain in the background. And when I saw Rossler's work the first time, I had to think about Mark Twain, who says, uh, God created war so that Americans can learn geography. <laughs> the selfie generation. And I thought this was a fantastic example of imperialist feminism, or if you like, Ivanka Trump feminism. I don't know what do we do with the F word, and I hear mean feminism, since Ivanka Trump call, started calling herself a feminist. Um, the second example, um, I'd just like to point out that Rossell says she particularly wants to make the connection, so thus the juxtaposing between destruction elsewhere and entitlement here. And this is something I'll keep coming back to again and again in my talk. The second um, um, uh, photograph that I'm going to share with you in a minute is from the photographer Kevin Carter. And this was taken in 1993 when he was on a trip to Sudan, um, where there was a, a horrible famine. And um, he was about to photograph a toddler who was crawling towards the feeding uh, center when a hooded culture, um, vulture, sorry, um, culture vulture. Uh, the vulture um, landed close by, and uh, he was explicitly told by aid workers not to touch the child because of fear of contamination. So the story goes that he took the photograph and um, you know, kind of chased the vulture away, and then he had to immediately leave. And um, I'm going to just show, I have to warn the audience, it's a distressing image. Um, he sold this image to New York Times uh, and won the Pulitzer Prize for this image. Um, New York Times got hundreds and hundreds of phone calls asking what happened to the girl. Um, at that point, we didn't know whether the child survived or not. What we do know is a few months later, Carter committed suicide. And there are various theories about why he committed suicide. But one of the theories is that he said that he couldn't go on doing what he was doing. Yeah. So the million dollar question that Lenin asks us what to do, yeah, was tun, um, is of course uh, is a hugely uh, dilemmatic uh, question. What we know later is in 2011 it came out that actually the toddler was a boy and he did manage to make it to the feeding center and survived for four years and died four years later. And another thing that has been controversially discussed about this particular image is that the, the vulture was actually not that close to the child. The angle of the photographs gives the impression that the child is going to be attacked by the vulture. Um, so again, this question of uh, affect, the relation of the ethics of affect, and um, also how, whether art, whether media can play a role in uh, mobilizing collective solidarity. Now at first, there seems to be nothing blameworthy about this demand that we, 
as citizens of liberal, affluent democracies take on responsibilities beyond the limits of our narrow self-interest, particularly in the, grow, uh, in the face of growing global interdependence. Cosmopolitanism, based on the normative espousal of an expansive global consciousness, opposes any kind of narrow, limited ter territorial patriotic loyalties. Transnational citizens' movements envisage the establishment of democratic global institutions that would facilitate direct participation in a global political life. The protagonists of international civil society are considered to be indispensable to the implementation of cosmopolitan values um, and are considered to be vanguards who will initiate a more just alter globalization. Along similar lines, the German sociologist Ulrich Beck points out that because we live in an increasingly interdependent world, we face common threats to our ecologies, finances, and security, so that violation of rights in, any, in one part of the world is felt everywhere. He calls it the globalization of risk um, that unites us in our equal vulnerability and provides the basis for what he calls a cosmopolitan moment of well, well, uh, world risk society, Welt Risiko Gesellschaft. So he asks the question, or in response to the question, how can the relationship between global risk and the creation of a global public be understood? Uh, Beck discusses what he calls, he says there is the globalization of risk on the one hand, and on the other hand, this is offset by what he calls the globalization of compassion. And he gives examples of the Haitian earthquake and the tsunamis, which spectacularly demonstrated the unprecedented ready readiness of citizens in faraway countries to donate to relief efforts. So uh, the World Risk Society's shocking threats open up questions of social accountability and responsibility that cannot be adequately addressed either in terms of national politics, because we are facing ecological crisis on such a global scale, that he says that we need to think in uh, terms of um, transnational and international politics, because nation states can no longer be taken as a unit of analysis. So Beck endorses what he calls a cosmopolitan realpolitik, viewing global institutions such as United Nations and International Criminal Court, as well as global NGOs and transnational social movements as legitimate vanguards of global governance. International NGOs, particularly like Amnesty International, Greenpeace, Human Rights Watch, enjoy a high level of legitimacy in the public sphere and are increasingly entrusted with the task of globally monitoring issues of global inequality, human rights, and ecology. Now, although Nussbaum and Beck enthusiastically endorse cosmopolitanism as a solution for past injustices and a promise for better times to come, I want to emphasize the complicities between liberal cosmopolitan articulations of solidarity and the global structures of domination they claim to resist. I object to the project of cosmopolitanism because it fails to seriously address the historical processes through which certain individuals are placed in a situation from which they aspire to global solidarity and universal benevolence. So in addition to categories like post-colonial, decolonial, post-socialist, black, white, queer, straight, Orient, Occident, Muslim, Christian, rest in the West, I am particularly interested in the division of the world between those who give and those who receive. Those who give solidarity, those who give help, aid, alliance, and those who are constructed as receivers. Beck proposes that our common vulnerability brings us together in the face of risk. But as we all know, we might be facing the same storm, but we are not all sitting in the same boat. And that makes all the difference. And I take actually this metaphor from Kofi Annan. So um, after the Copenhagen climate talks, Co Kofi Annan came out and gave this very, very inspiring interview where he said we cannot not respond to the ecological crisis because we are all sitting in the same boat. And while I was watching this interview, I thought, no, Kofi. And just a disclaimer here, I'm not on first name basis with Kofi Annan. This was all happening in my head. Um, I was like, no, we might be facing the same storm and we're not sitting in the same boat. Remember the Titanic? And your chances of survival dependent on which deck you were? So that's basically my argument. And the other point that I, of course, want to come back to and which I will keep coming back to is, how does the pain and suffering of other people make us into ethical and political subjects? So now let me, before I move on to my next section, let me add a very, very important footnote and clarify my critique of cosmopolitanism. 
actually the pejorative sense of cosmopolitan uh, cosmopolitanism has its origins in German anti-Semitic discourse. The rootless Jew was seen as a cosmopolitan citizen from nowhere. Similarly, from 1948 to 1953, Joseph Stalin led an anti-cosmopolitan campaign targeting particularly Jewish intellectuals, architects, and scientists precisely as rootless cosmopolitans or cosmopolitans without a homeland, implying that cosmopolitanism was necessarily anti-patriotic. More recently, the current Prime Minister of UK, Theresa May, at the Conservative Party's annual conference remarked, and I quote her, if you believe you're a citizen of the world, you're a citizen of nowhere. You don't understand what citizenship means. Just to share an image with you, so this was immediately after Brexit, one of the first foreign trips that Theresa May did was to land in Hyderabad and Bangalore to hold bilateral talks in India. Apropos anti-cosmopolitanism. Now, <laughs> and like this form of anti-cosmopolitanism, which falls back on ethnic and economic nationalism, my concern comes, I mean, my concern vis-a-vis um, -vis this whole celebration of cosmopolitanism comes from an unreflected construction of we the people and the borderless planet. Now let me outline in the next section my problem with the constitution of the global demos and the tricky politics of street protest in more detail to outline how practices and discourses of solidarity and injustice can be non-performative. So I'm taking this notion, of course, from Sarah Ahmed, in that there is a discontinuity between what is promised and what one receives. So the next section, and I hope the queers in the room will appreciate it, is called the erotics of resistance. In the past decades, there has been a proliferation of protest movements that seek to reconfigure international politics by way of interpolating a global demos that has been wronged by the neoliberal beast. From Porta del Sol to, Tux to Taksim, from Syntagma to Tahrir Square, from Hong Kong to New Delhi, street politics seem to have transformed the way power, agency, and resistance are being perceived and performed. And for the next couple of minutes, I'm going to be particularly drawing on the book Dispossession by Butler and uh, by Judith Butler and um, Athana Athana CEO. I just um, made sure that my pronunciation was right, and my colleague tells me it was not wrong, at least. <laughs> By inserting new actors into the political stage through appropriation and resignification of political discourses, these counterpublics, and this is of course a notion by Nancy Fraser, is, it is argued are instigating deliberation on issues of redistribution, inequality, recognition, and representation. Replacing the Habermasian idea of public spheres where rational subjects came to deliberate over common interests, counterpublics, it is promised, can be read as affect worlds where public anger, outrage, frustration reshape the terms of state and civil society relation. This indicates the emancipatory effects of civil disobedience in that they challenge and transform dominant forms of rule, which manifest themselves in multiple ways in the economic, cultural, and socio-political arenas. The San Precario movement, the Arab Leons, the Indignados, Occupy Wall Street demonstrations, the various refugee strikes against coercive migration regimes are examples of emergence of counter movements and counter public spheres against neoliberalism and neocolonialism that address multiple and intersecting dynamics of inequalities and injustice. Now, despite important differences in goals and strategies in the above mentioned protest movements, it is claimed that these are horizontally organized mostly employing social media like Facebook, blogs, and Twitter. So one term that we keep encountering is horizontal solidarity. And I'll show you what my problems with this are. This direct action on the streets alleges to bring together immensely heterogeneous groups, inducing what Butler and Athanasiu call spontaneous solidarity. These bodies on the street are vulnerable to police force and state violence, even as they oppose their disenfranchisement and marginalization and demand accountability from their political representatives. The copper reality and collectivity of the masses as they assemble to protest political and economic dispossession can be read as an exercise of popular will and as a bodily message of popular sovereignty. The occupation and claiming of public spaces mark a, a shift of political life from corridors of power to the street. 
in reclaiming democracy from capitalism and corporate power, it is argued the subversive and disruptive potentiality of dispossessed bodies is evidence. So when I was reading um, Dispossession, the book, uh, and also later Butler's uh, uh, book on uh, assemblies, I had to think about the, this iconic image of the tank man from the Tiananmen uh, Square protest. And uh, many, many years ago, when I first encountered this image of the tank man, I had to think about Nietzsche's metaphor to describe the state as the coldest of all cold monsters. So on, the, on your right hand side, you see you know, the manifestation of state military power, the state monopoly of violence, and the vulnerability of the protester. Now, protest movements in different parts of the world evoke promises of radical political change through shaming powerful states and international financial institutions into good behavior. However, the question remains, how effective are these fantasies of radical change through hashtag activism and Twitter insurgencies in fundamentally transforming social, political, economic relations in the era of post-colonial late capitalism. Now I constantly, I suppose you too, I constantly get these mails from really radical political initiatives, save the bees in 24 hours, or save the Brazilian rainforest in one week by signing this petition. Spoiler alert, it does not work. In my view, there is an intrinsic ambivalence at the heart of these protest movements. On the one hand, without the longings, desires, fantasies, ideas, and imagination for another political order, resistance cannot be envisioned. These protest movements powerfully negate the TINA principle. Remember Thatcher told us there is no alternative? On the other hand, it seems to me that the fantasies and longings manifested in current protests wittingly and unwittingly reproduce processes of subalternization of marginal subjects and collectivities that have a tenuous relation both to the state as well as non-state spaces. The romantic enthusiasm evoked by these assemblies erase the exploitative and exclusionary material conditions that make, the possi that make possible the exercise of agency of the resistors. When, for instance, the anti-capitalist protester twitters with his or her iPad, which is produced under super exploitative working conditions in the global south, the phantasma of the subversion of capitalism reveals itself as a surreal moment of a class privilege jouissance. An erotics of resistance that is marked by a new international division of labor, which sustains the discontinuities between those who resist and those who cannot. So very often when I present, um, or no, not very often, but a couple of times when I've presented these um, arguments, um, immediately after my talk, the first question that was raised was, did you just disagree with Butler? So those of you all who are still uh, confused about this after my presentation, yes, I am disagreeing with Butler. We, who are located on the privileged side of transnationalism, must resist the desire to stage ourselves as the powerless and think that Fanon had us in mind when he wrote The Wretched of the Earth. Yeah. History did not happen so that we can save the world. Foucault proposes that where there is power, there is resistance. I would add, where there is resistance, there is power. Against the claim that a common vulnerability brings us together, I would counter argue that deep asymmetries of power and wealth cannot be corrected simply by sharing street the street or cyberspace for a common cause of facing police violence together. Civil society as well as social movements are marked by hierarchies and exclusions that are disturbingly overlooked in celebratory discourses about their opposition to the state. The staging of the state as an agent of terror and civil society as an agent of salvation can have vicious neocolonial and imperialist consequences, particularly for subaltern groups. We should not forget that this division between the good civil society and the bad state starts with Hegel. It has a particular historical moment. And I'll bring later Gramsci into the game. Transnational counterpublics tend to empower transnational civil society actors whose will to good, do good and will to resist is marked by feudality and enabled by a new neoliberal framing. It is thus imperative to ask whether enthusiastic discourses of resistance are empowering for disenfranchised communities or do they simply reinforce relations of domination between those who act and those on whose behalf 
these colorful and lively uprisings and revolts are being staged. I hope the absurdity of, uh, of the claim of twittering one's way out of capitalism is not lost on this audience. So now let me illustrate what I have just said using two concrete examples to demonstrate the discontinuities between the doers and receivers of justice. And I do see that new modes of collectivity can emerge by drawing on gendered vulnerability as a site of political agency. So insofar, I agree with Butler. I am with Butler till that point. But I also believe that it can also be a site for co coercive politics. So the first example. The Delhi gang rape case incited spontaneous nationwide protests against sexual violence and the abysmal failure of the Indian state to ensure the safety of its female citizens. In a country with one of the highest incidents of rape in the world, it was unprecedented when thousands and thousands of people came out to, the, to protest the lack of safety for women in public spaces. What was unique about these protests was that they were not organized by any political party or NGO. As was expected, the Indian civil society was celebrated in the world media for taking to the streets while the Indian government was sharply condemned for its violence against the protesters. And then came the unexpected part. The civil society contributed to creating an atmosphere where instant retributive justice measures, such as the death penalty and castration of rapists, gained shrill uh, popularity, while experts recommended technology-based criminal justice, which would involve surveillance cameras in public spaces creating a database of sexual offenders, setting up fast track codes to speed up the process of investigation, trial, and judgment in cases of sexual violence. Now, parallel to the Delhi gang rape, 19 so-called untouchable Dalit women were raped in the neighboring state of Haryana. And this was not even reported in the national media. Forget the international media. So one has to ask, or this raises the question, what kind of bodies need to be violated for the mobilization of the collectivity. Who's the we? In whose name justice is demanded? This demonstrates how subaltern groups are marginalized by both the civil society as well as the state. This brings me to my second example. Um, in the aftermath of the sexual assaults during the 2016 New Year's Eve celebrations, there has been a systematic demonization of all migrants and refugees as sexist and misogynist, while weakening the consensus in favor of Germany accepting large number of refugees. It serves as a very good example of the fickleness of proclamations of German welcome culture and global solidarity. So here we see the Pegida, the patriotic Europeans against the Islamization of um, uh, the Occident. And uh, they took out a, a rally immediately after the um, Cologne incidents and coined this extremely racist term, refugees not welcome. Um, a lot of women came out on the streets and accused Merkel that she was more interested in protecting the rights of non-citizens than her own citizens. This was a very controversially discussed image, uh, which says that respect us, we are not fair game, even when we are naked, again insinuating that um, you know there's no rape in Europe and the migrants bring it with them. Um, just a little backstory to this construction of the rapable white women. Now, when the first genocide of the 20th century was committed, which was in the uh, which was a genocide committed in the German colony against the Herero Nama people, um, this myth of the black, ra black rapists, which Angela Davis talks about, was the, the, the idea of the black peril. Yeah? The demonization of black sexuality was again and again whipped up to legitimize the violence against the colonized. So there's a very long and rich tradition of this construction of you know, the vulnerable white women, and we have, to tr we have to protect our women from their men. Um, Charlie Hebdo, the embodiment of liberal values. So um, on top of the image, on the left side, you see the little caricature of Alan Kurdi, the three-year-old Syrian boy who died uh, on the beach, of, whose body was found on the beach of Turkey. And the question is, what would have become of little Alan had he survived? And then you see two um, pig-faced men chasing after women. And the punchline is, ask Groper in Germany. Now, in response to these extremely racist uh, demonstrations, there were counter-demonstrations. 
taken out by Syrian refugees themselves, particularly men, but also by German feminists. And they said they took inspiration from Angela Davis, and they organized a demonstration under the title Reclaim Feminism, and they said we do not want feminism to be weaponized to deny the human rights of refugees, to deny them their, um, their, their right to receive asylum. Now what happened at this uh, counter demonstrations, and I know this because I lived for six years in uh, Cologne and I have a lot of students who were involved in, the, in, in organizing this demonstration. What happened was that there was a lot of, um, there was a presence of a lot of autonomous groups in these counter demonstrations. So anti-ra, anti-fa, anti-imperial, uh, anti-imp. I, I hang out with a lot of anarchist uh, students. Uh, remember Marx, who will educate the educator? So my anarchist students have taught me all this cool vocabulary. So anti-rise, anti-racist, anti-imperialists, anti 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 and anti-fa are the anti-fascists. So these are autonomous groups who participated in these counter demonstrations. And a lot of um, fights broke out between these autonomous groups and particularly female police officers. And what happened as a consequence of this tension is a lot of migrants and refugees who were participating in these counter demonstrations left the demonstrations because they were scared of getting into trouble with the police. So those in whose name these demonstrations were being taken out could not themselves be present at the demonstration. I had to, when I heard this story, I had to think about Arendt who says, it was not what our enemies did, but what our friends did. In his deconstructive reading of Kantian cosmopolitan ethics, the French philosopher Jacques Derrida discusses how Kantian idea of hospitality is temporary in nature and hinges on the guest behaving themselves. Yeah, so Kant in um, Perpetual Peace gives us an absolutely brilliant theory of universal right to hospitality. He's not, he says that when somebody lands on my doorstep, it's not just that this person should hope to be treated with benevolence, but rather given the common ownership of the earth, we have a right to be treated with hospitality. However, Kantian idea of hospitality is conditional. He says the host is obliged to extend hospitality to the guest as long as the guest behaves themselves, does not create trouble. But as soon as the guest creates trouble, you can withdraw hospitality. And Derrida traces elements of hostility in Kantian hospitality and talks about hospitality, hostile hospitality, and says that truly um, cosmopolitan hospitality or a truly cosmopolitan ethics would entail absolute hospitality, which is unconditional and is not qualified upon the guest fulfilling certain criteria or duties to receive it. So you cannot have a politics of solidarity where you put conditions on the person who receives my solidarity should be deserving and should be, should in a certain way fulfill the criteria that I set to be interpolated as an adequate object of my solidarity. Yeah? Derrida, I mean, it's a pretty radical idea of hospitality. He says that unconditional hospitality is when the host becomes hostage to the guest and gives up sovereignty to his or her own home. I'd like to conclude by addressing the important issue of transnational cooperation and solidarity by addressing um, or by drawing on the Sri Lankan feminist Malati De Alvis, who asks if we are truly capable of empathizing with the pain of others, or even if we should be allowed to witness their suffering if this witnessing only serves to affirm our humanity. Yeah? So we witness the pain and suffering of others so that we can reassure ourselves that we have the capacity to care. And she asked the fundamental question if we should be even allowed to witness other people's pain. Correspondingly, of course, we need to find authentic victims who truly deserve our benevolence. And then, of course, the question arises, what do we do with our will to empower the disenfranchised and the vulnerable, and how do we deal with those who refuse to be interpolated as appro appropriate objects of our solidarity? In Anti-Oedipus, Capitalism and Schizophrenia, Deleuze and Gothari elaborate, and I quote them, 
The way a bureaucrat fondles his records, a judge administers justice, a businessman causes money to circulate, the way the bourgeoisie fucks the proletariat. Flags, nations, armies, banks, get a lot of people aroused. End of quote. I would add that fantasies of radical change through protest politics are getting a lot of urban class privilege subjects very aroused. The fact that they are complicit in the very structures they are contesting is conveniently veiled by the rhetorics of disenfranchised global demos. Now, in 2011, Time Magazine's Person of the Year was the protester. And I would argue that if you have made it to the cover of the Time Magazine, it's a sure sign that your politics is in trouble. <laughs> so again, popu against popular sentiments, I would not place my um, faith solely in extra state spaces as sites of radical change or as civil society, whether international or domestic civil society uh, actors as being vanguards of radical change. Despite the crisis of legitimacy of nation states, it is dangerous to disregard the political implications of what Michel Foucault calls state phobic discourses and positions, which are immensely popular in radical discourses in the West. As Foucault warns, state phobia is deeply inscribed in liberal and neoliberal ideas of civil society. The wickedness of the state is juxtaposed against the inherent goodness of civil society, whereby uh, radical politics is located in extra state space of innovation. And here I would rather take the position put forth by Gramsci and Spivak that civil society can function as a site of consolidation of power, even as it claims to resist and subvert power. So I'm going to end with another example. And here we go. Because of trivializing social movements, particularly Black Lives Matter. And um, there are various levels on which this ad is provocative. I mean, just the screenshot shows the heteronormative uh, coding of um, yeah. But what I think is really provocative about this ad is that it's a truly Gramscian ad. Seriously. <laughs> because it shows how the civil society is connected to the state by the market. <laughs> <laughs> Something that we very, very conveniently like to blur out. Um, Civil society, as Gramsci tells us, cannot disable the coercive apparatus of the state, for it is linked to the state through the market. Furthermore, one gets the impression as if there is a collectivity that emerges in the form of civil society. However, this blurs how civil society is the site of production of hegemony and a sphere of continual process of conflict and strife where the particular interest, and I'm here I'm literally quoting Gramsci, the particular interests of a certain class are presented as the general interests of all. Civil society is the safety valve of the state that releases pressure and de-escalates without fundamental transformation. So Gramsci tells us about passive civil uh, revolution where the, old is, where the old dies but the new cannot be born. And that's the function of civil society. As part of Anish Kapoor's recent exhibition in Berlin, well, it's not that recent, it was a couple of years ago, titled The Death of Leviathan, we see a deflated PVC whale that sags its way across three rooms. Kapoor explains that the melancholic deflating piece speaks about the decline of the state being experienced in Europe and beyond. In his essay, The Death of Leviathan, Form as a Political Issue, Horst Bredekam explains that the lifeless form of the veil symbolizes the process of the withering away of the state that has already been set in motion. However, this does not mean a liberated anarchy, but rather the pitiable horror of this dying sculpture warns of the approaching disempowerment of its citizens. Given its contradictory conduct, where it is simultaneously enabling as well as coercive, Feminists are caught in an extremely ambivalent double bind vis-a-vis -vis the state. If the state is harnessed for male hegemony, should feminists be wary 
of state-centered reforms? Or can, and this is a million dollar question, the state be mobilized to promote gender justice? Can it function as a site of redress of gender inequality, even as it perpetuates gender ideologies, which are founding myths of the nation state? Can shaming states into good behavior be a systematic feminist strategy? Um, can the coercive powers of the state be used? I mean, it's a very contaminated tool to use Audre Lorde's um, metaphor. Can the coercive powers of the state be used, be instrumentalized towards emancipatory progressive projects? Despite my critique of the state, and I'm not a naive statist, um, despite the critique, a very important critique of the state for its abdication of responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis its most vulnerable citizens, I find the rise of state-phobic discourses extremely troubling. So contra contrary to Friedrich Nietzsche's idea of the state as monstre frua, I prefer Jacques Derrida's idea of the state as, I mean, uh, Derrida doesn't talk about it in the context of the state, so I use his concept and apply it to the state. So Derrida speaks about pharmacon, something that can be both poison and counterpoison, medicine. And I see the state more like Derrida's pharmacon. If, following Foucault, civil society itself is a concept of governmental technology. If citizens and states are constituted through practices of governing, then it is impossible to take up for or against uh, positions vis-a-vis -vis the state. Rather, the inconsistencies, hesitancies, failures, crises in forms of governing need to be exploited to enable the rights of the governed. This is not about re-engineering the state, but about reconfiguring the art of government. Political agency for subaltern groups lies not in anti-statism or post-nationalism, but instead in their insertion into the existing framework of the nation state. Despite the nation state's crisis of legitimacy, it is dangerous to disregard the political impl uh, implications of state phobic positions, which are immensely popular in both radical but also conservative discourses in the West. One should not forget when Steve Bannon was asked what his project was, he said to deconstruct the administrative state. I mean, he actually used the word deconstruct. Poor Derrida, he must be spinning in his grave. <laughs> so it seems to me that perceiving the state narrowly as a repressive apparatus is problematic and that instead we should train our imagination to envisage a different state which is capable of articulating the will of excluded subaltern populations. In India, we have a joke. The only democratic right that Indians take great pleasure in exercising is the right to criticize the government. All other rights are considered to be a colonial hangover. <laughs> so in that spirit, the politics of the governed in the era of neoliberal globalization does not lie beyond the state, but in its reconfiguration. Not taking the state as monster frua, but as Pharmacon. The challenge, of course, is how do we convert poison into counter poison? Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for your talk. I have so many thoughts in, in, in my head, as I'm sure everyone else does. So let's open it up for uh, QA, and we have about half an hour. Uh, any questions at the moment? Don't be shy. Go for it. I could continue for another half an hour. I mean, like <laughs> I said, I, I can talk. Yes. Just wait for the mic, please. Thank you. It's more of a comment and to see how you would respond to this other image that I'm not sure you're familiar with. But in 2013, in Taksim, in the Gezi Park Rebellion, um, I'm just curious to see, to know if you know of the image where the two men go up to the tank and punch it. And if you're not familiar with that, I can give you the link for that. And I'm just wondering how, you know, just if that's something you think about how you would analyze that. and your response to something um, like that. Could you clarify, they go up to the? The tank, so the image of the tank with the man mm -hmm. standing in front of the tank and being helpless. Because mm -hmm. as an American living in Turkey, it was such a moment to watch on television mm -hmm. because these men just went up to the tank and punched it. I punched it, okay. So I just found it powerful and interesting and I'm just wondering how you would respond to that. Um, 
Uh, this was at Gezi Park. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it kind of, um, it kind of uh, again, confirms this Nietzschean idea of the state as a monster fua and this feeling of helplessness vis-a-vis -vis this immensely powerful monster. Um, I think I'd like to answer your question a bit indirectly. So there's a very nice anecdote told by the uh, materialist Marxist state theorist Bob Jessup. So Bob Je Jessup tells us of an uh, encounter that he had. He was on the way to a conference. And the person sitting next to him seemed to be going to the same conference because he was reading the same papers as Jos Bob Jessup. So Jessup decided to introduce himself and turned to him and said, hello, I'm Bob Jessup, and I'm a state theorist. So this gentleman sitting next to him turned around and said, I'm Nicholas Luhmann, and the state does not exist. <laughs> and Bob, Bob Jessup says that the one question that gives state theorists sleepless nights, the one question that state theorists dread is the question, what is the state? And he says this remark of Nicholas Luhmann uh, provoked a irritation in German, unlike in English, where irritation is, you know, uh, has negative connotations. German, in German, it has a positive connotation also. And he said that for many, many years, I was perplexed by the idea of not just what to do with the state, but what is a state? How do you define a state? And uh, he thinks about uh, Nicholas Luhmann's idea of the state does not exist as does this mean that the government is not functioning the way it should function? Or that the state as a homogeneous, coherent entity with an intentional, wicked will does not exist? And I actually like to bring together Gramsci and Foucault, where Gramsci gives us the idea of state as comprising of persuasion and coercion. Yes, civil society as a site where consensus is produced, and then, of course, the repressive, which Althusser takes from Gramsci, the repressive state uh, apparatus. And Foucault, to bring in Foucault, he says the state is the mobile effect of multiple governmentalities. So the example that you shared with us shows, again, this understanding of the embodiment of state as, a cohere, as if the state exists. And I think we need to again and again remind ourselves not to position ourselves in opposition to the bad state and we the good guys who are victims of the state because we in many, many ways are contaminated um, by being within structures which enable our agency that are made possible through state apparatus. So that Punching the tank is only made possible through the state apparatus. And a, a, a lot, of, lot, of, lot of very differing ideologies also. Further questions? It's, it's probably better for the mic because I'm not sure if the talk is being recorded and usually recordings go through the mic, so. Okay, um, thank you, that was, that was fascinating. And I, I feel like I shouldn't ask a question because I'd quite like you to continue for another half an hour. Um, I don't know if I have a question so much as something that struck me that um, seems interesting to me, I suppose. And it's the, the contrasting of the <coughs> the very explicit positioning of the market between civil society and the state in the, uh, in the Pepsi advert. And, uh, and my Chinese history is, is very, uh, very limited, but the sense that the, um, the Tiananmen Square image, um, in a sense, the, the, the market in those terms was uh, certainly much smaller in China then, in the late 80s, than it, it, I think late 80s when Tiananmen Square, than it is now. And I, I have a sense, and I'm entirely prepared to be corrected, that one of the instigators, one of the uh, precursors perhaps to the increased opening up of the capitalist market in China was Tiananmen Square. So in a sense that image shows 
probably not the absence of the market, but certainly the, in visual terms, the absence of the market. And it was a protest that at least played some kind of role, I believe, in um, opening up China to um, what I would consider to be perhaps the destructive forces of the market in ways. So I, I, I don't know if there is a response to that, but it's, it's something that, that struck me anyway. Thank you very much. I, um, I must admit that I hadn't thought about it uh, explicitly in those terms, so I'm going to go up and do up my reading and see the connections more explicitly. So thank you. I think uh, I'll take that as a comment to uh, do my homework. <laughs> more questions? Yes? Hello, thank you for the very comprehensive, uh, very um, wise talk, I would say. Um, I, though I was really interested to, to see how you would actually finish the, the talk, and I, I was really happy with what you said at the end of the day, how you, what we do with the state in itself. Like, we do find it problematic, and you see in the civil society that there is this tiredness, you know, these protests look like, you know, as in the video is being shown, like, it just, like, go for some sort of entertainment, but, like, the reality behind the pain, the struggles of the people is being all co-opted uh, within the neoliberal system. And, uh, and I, I can't really say much, but like, what would be your remedy in a way? How would you see the state going on? Especially when you talk about also the, the civil society, which basically it's, again, very much co-opted within, within this system. I, I'm, the example that you gave for uh, Amnesty International, and I actually working in the field, I know that Amnesty International in itself is quite problematic because it's like co-opting and fighting for issue rather than resolving the, the, the problems in itself. Like, of course, this is being there, like, you know, resolving, helping and stuff, but this is, seems not to be the, the main goal, but rather one of the second and secondary goal, but the fight for issues is more, more important than, than showing and helping and becoming something better, I mean, mm -hmm. changing the society in itself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, again, it's something that I'm uh, working on with colleagues and thinking together. So there's a book project that, uh, which was also part, I mean, is a result of a number of um, symposiums and uh, symposia and uh, workshops that we had together. And it's uh, entitled uh, Reimagining the State. And uh, the challenge that we have uh, put for ourselves is how can we rethink our relationship to the state? Yeah? So to go back to the uh, Jessup um, Luman, um, you know, um, uh, encounter. One could say, okay, should we desire that the state ceases to exist? Yeah, because if it is this monster frua, do we want? Uh, uh, which is, of course, what the anarchists aspire to. Yeah? I mean, somebody like James Scott, in his book *The Politics of Not Being Governed*, gives the example of Zomia. Yeah, these are the highlands in the Asia, in Asia which are border regions where a lot of subaltern groups evade the state. And James Scott says that state evasion is a strategy of survival for many groups because of the coercive um, state apparatus. Interestingly, after his book, so his book was very, very celebrated by the anarchists, was taken as an example of how, you know, um, historically state forms are extremely violent and coercive. Um, a few months later, a few years later, James Scott gave an interview where he said that actually, given the context in which we live, we cannot imagine to desire to do away with the state, but rather we need to tame the state. It's interesting he uses the term tame and says this avatar-like idea that you know you burn all the bridges and you reject modernity and kind of withdraw in some kind of non-state space is a, it's, it's actually not convincing for him. So one of the most important anarchist thinkers himself says that this post-state kind of vision is not really enabling for subaltern groups, but rather for subaltern groups, the, um, the hope lies in reimagining their relationship to the state. And here I think it's uh, a point of departure would be not to homogenize the state. There are differences between, for example, the Scandinavian state and the American, US American state, between Bolivian state 
and the South African state. And this genealogy of state formation, uh, the aspirations that many, many post-colonial peoples had, uh, or the colonized people had, that you know, sovereignty uh, was a promise of self-determination and self-governance, that we should not lose sight of that because, um, and here again I'll make a connection to Foucault. When Foucault talks about state phobia, he says this is a very, very particular encounter of Germans with fascism that leads to state phobia that is being universalized. So again, a European experience of state turning totalitarian is becoming universalized by saying, look, we have to be wary of the state. Yeah? And um, Foucault shows how anti-state positions, whether they're anarchist or neoliberal, dovetail to produce a neoliberal, neoliberal governmentality. So he does a very, very, I mean, insightful analysis of what he calls German order liberalism. Yeah? He shows that after the Second World War, there were huge discussions about whether German as a state should even exist. And um, political grounds for the existence of the German state were rejected because of German fascism, because of national socialism. So the only justification for the German state, for the existence of German state, was that the market will regulate the politics. And that's the birth of how, what, what Foucault traces as state phobia. And he again and again warns, if you read his Collège de France lectures, his, his lectures on governmentality, he warns against this impulse to homogenize the state, to think as if the state exists as a coherent entity which has a core. And I think that would be perhaps a possibility. I'm not making, I'm not giving, I'm not going to give you all a, you know, blueprint, a 10 point plan of how to make a more emancipatory state. I mean, that you can get from Arthur Nussbaum, right? The capabilities approach where you have 10 points and then at the end of the 10 points when you tick the boxes, you get an emancipated woman. <laughs> I unfortunately can't give you these recipes of you know, how, to, how to have a good state. I think we need to, we need to be, ve we need to be very um, cognizant of different forms of state formation, different dynamics of civil society, state relations, and different ways of reimagining our relationship to the state. Both the elites, people like me and us, I'm interpolating in this room. I mean, we are the ones who are located on, a, on the privileged side of transnationality and for subaltern groups. That would be my long answer to your very, very important question. Um, thank you for this very inspiring talk. Um, my question is about the popular feminist protests that we've seen all around the world in the past few years. Uh, what I have in mind is the black protest in Poland, Niuna Menos in South America, um, anti-Trump demonstrations in the US or worldwide, international women's strike. And um, what I think is different in these pro protests, um, based on your analysis of radical popular slash radical protests is that, first of all, there are no clashes with the police. And second, the state is implicated in the political discourses. It's not openly addressed, but the demands implicate a recognition of the state as an, as an actor. So I'm wondering what you think about these protests, whether they offer us another perspective on civil state-civil society relations, how you consider them. Um. I think I'll, uh, I'll give you a lazy answer. I'll repeat what I said in the talk um, towards the end. I think um, I, I find Derrida's, um, no, I'm sorry, Gramsci's um, analysis quite helpful, where he shows, he's not talking about protest movements, but he's talking about the function of civil society. And he's not, he's not rejecting civil society also. As a, he doesn't use the word counter-hegemony. It's something that is used quite popularly, but. Gramsci himself doesn't use the notion of counter-hegemony. But Gramsci does say that although civil society has the, I mean, it is a site of production of hegemony, but it also has the possibility of challenging hegemony, of transforming hegemony. But at the same time, he does warn us that civil society, in a certain way, releases, de-escalates. 
And my worry, what I was trying to critique in my presentation was that we have to be careful not to be satisfied with this moment of de-escalation, where we go out. I mean, I take affect, the, the, the role of political emotions very seriously. So uh, what, what Butler and Athanasiu say, that you, know, you go out on the street, you have this feeling of being part of a collectivity, and that it can function as a site of political agency, is very compelling. And I, find, I agree with them to a certain extent. But what I'm interested in is how, and here comes Gramsci, how every uh, political mobilization produces moments of subalternity, moments of exclusion. Because I think, I, I presume, to create a Habermasian moment here, everybody will agree that no social movement can be all-inclusive because of various constraints, economic constraints, but other constraints. And those moments of exclusion are very, very instructive that we need to take serious. So I'm very, very interested in how subalternization is produced. And subalternity not as an identity, that you're black or you're poor or you're uh, queer, but, but of being excluded from access to both state, public sphere, civil society, extra state space, whatever whatever notion you feel comfortable with. Um, thank you for this thought-provoking lecture. So my question is more about uh, the visual part and the representation. So you showed us a lot of iconic images, images that are considered iconic, and it's kind of this, uh, you just started to talk about some of them and probably a lot of us in the audience could immediately foresee what we're gonna see because we've seen them many times before. So, uh, and that also led you to a reflection on the um, aesthetics of protests. That was very powerful and how that aesthetics is very compelling, desired and uh, can be with that also easily appropriated as we have seen in the, the Pepsi ad. Uh, so my question is more about, uh, yeah, refle reflecting on this um, kind of iconicity of representation of uh, social movements. And I'm thinking here along Susan Zontag and John Berger from his About Looking book, if you, know, if you could maybe say a little bit more, more about that. Um. I'm actually, again, thinking there's a, there's a lot of work to be done. At my end, I have to do a lot of homework. I'm still thinking through uh, this question of what role images, art, media can play in, the, in processes of decolonization. Do they have a role or should we, I mean, when art says we are autonomous, we, we, do, not, we do not have the responsibility to be, you know, um, explicitly uh, facilitating radical change. So that is one position. There is this other position which says that actually when one uses images or art, it, the, the role should be of estrangement and defamiliarization rather than familiarization. So I was also told, why do you use images that are actually familiar? Yeah, because there is this moment of comfort. You know, you know the image. Like you said, you knew what was coming. Rather use images that are not known. Um, I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, I do use certain images that are known, but at the same time, um, I hope that I still kind of uh, provoke a certain thinking. I mean, I've been told very often that, the, that my claim that the Pepsi ad is Gramscian is not something that they would, they would think Gramsci and the Pepsi ad together. <laughs> So I hope that there was a little bit of surplus in my using iconic images or ads uh, and like kind of provoking and you know incommensurability also this moment of incommensurability to actually presume that the ad maker had read Gramsci and was trying to show the connection between civil society and the state <laughs> through the market. Uh, I hope. Also that. exposing meaning because you have this reference to you know the icon other iconic images like handing the flower to the military because. The Vietnam, yeah, thank you. The, For Vietnam, the Vietnam protests, yeah. but also other pr kind of very powerful images from protests, protests that emerged around the same time, as far as I remember, as this ad was released, like, uh, you know, a black woman facing the, the police at the protest yeah. in Sweden directly. Th th those, like, are very, of course, it kind of 
that's totally different thing with, with the same imagery, but you have these references in the back of your head, mm. maybe, maybe okay. not. So let me show you one image which um, I'm still struggling with. Yeah, I haven't figured it out, so that which is why it was not part of my presentation. And I think I'm doing a little something a little bit risky, so we'll see what happens. But let me, I mean, there's nothing to be scared. I'm not showing you a very <laughs> violent image, but it's an image which I'm really struggling with. So let me give you the background and then show you this image. This is a 12-year-old boy, Devon Hart, who was photographed during a 2014 uh, protest in Portland, Oregon, over the grand jury's uh, decision not to indict a police officer in the shooting of a black man, Michael Brown, in uh, Ferguson, Missouri. And the boy was holding a free hug sign, and he was standing there crying. And then a Portland officer saw the sign and asked if he could have a hug, and the kid hug the police officer. So here we again have another juxtapositioning of the state and vulnerable uh, population. I don't know, I don't know what to do with the image, but I saw the image and I, I saved it on my, in my <laughs> PowerPoint. So this is, I, how many of you all knew this image? So not that many in the audience. So that would be an image that be a counterpoint. And the story gets even more tragic because a few weeks back, so this kid um, was adopted by a um, couple, a gay couple. And a few weeks back, um, uh, the, the family was sitting in a car which went off the cliff. And we don't know what has happened to this kid. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, really tragic. And the gay couple who adopted this kid is a white couple, um, two lesbians. And they have, um, I think as far as I know, um, mostly black children whom they have adopted. So uh, I think images are just like, I mean, I see images like words for me. It's like Derrida, what Derrida says, there's nothing outside the text. And it's every time you use a word, every time you use an image, it's risky because it's, indispensable, but at the same time inadequate in trying to understand what I'm trying to understand. It, don't get me, I mean, I, I hope you, uh, I don't get into trouble with organizers because I suppose they invite me as an authority who knows what she's talking about. <laughs> but um, speaking is always risky because sometimes we say more than what, what we understand. And I think that's important also. There's a question okay. in the middle. Yeah. Um, hi. Thank you very much for the presentation. And um, I would like to, I don't know if it's turning around, but I would like to ask you on a reflection that is bugging me in my research um, quite strongly on this question of um, protest culture and the changing of protest culture into actually basically state celebration. I'm specifically talking about the case that I'm working on, um, which is regarding a research in the UK city of culture and specifically the event of um, the UK Pride event that was taking place for the very first time. And in this specific regard, I would like to ask you for your reflections in respect to the fact how easily we see in the Pepsi advertisement how easily certain aesthetics can be used in order to shift um, into a capitalistic kind of representation of certain values. But I would like to ask you in this respect in, in what kind of way you would consider state uh, the claiming of the state for certain values, and specific in regards to homonationalism, in regards to kind of claiming in the UK very much that this is an, an equal country. Um, and specifically, as part of this kind of idea of the UK pride was the element of actually kills the protest. It was embedded in a, in a week-long celebration of 50 years of partial decriminalization of um, homosexuality, uh, homosexuality in the UK, or in England and Wales. Um, but actually neglecting completely the fact that there was a protest um, that initiated uh, the entire trajectory of, mm -hmm. of the event. Could you share some reflection on the question of when it's not capitalist owned mm -hmm. or c owned by a market but owned by the state mm -hmm. to share certain values or claim certain values? Yeah. I mean, basically you're asking the question about appropriation and co-option. Whether it's you're being co-opted by the corporate uh, interests or being co-opted co uh, when, when progressive politics is being co-opted by the state or 
the market or corporate uh, uh, interests. I think what is important here is uh, multi-directional critique. So this is, I, I think the intervention on debates on homonationalism, critique of homonationalism, have been extremely important. But my problem with somebody like, for example, Jasbir Poir is, when Jasbir Poir was asked about, you know, um, uh, homophobic, sexist practices, discriminatory politics within migrant communities, within post-colonial context, she said, but this is not what I'm critiquing. This is not what is the object of my critique. And I think that's too convenient for me. I think what we need to do is see the entanglements between different forms of political positions, how seemingly oppositional uh, patriarchal ideologies in some ways reinforce and consolidate each other. So I'll give you an, kind of an abstract answer. I, I think we have to be very cognizant and very, very vigilant about state co-option of progressive politics. So there I'm completely on one page with a critique of homonationalism and pink watching and you know, state uh, attempts at pink washing. But at the same time, we need to develop a multi-directional multi critique where we don't only target co-option by the state, but also co-option co by also other progressive politics. Um, so which is why I, 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 I take Hannah Arendt very seriously where she says, it's not just what our enemies did, but also what our friends did. There's a question here first. Uh, thank you very much for such insightful talk and the, the answers now uh, as well. Uh, I come from a different background, but I'm a bit taken um, about what's happening now in Brazil now and now for a few years already. It started with, we have every week we have another social movement. And one of the last one was about uh, the death of, uh, the, the assassination actually of the LGBT rights defender Marielle Santos. And uh, it started about that, and uh, actually we should mention it also her driver was assassinated a long hand, but that kind of disappeared. And uh, um, th there were so many flags there about, uh, about her or regarding this, this assassination. And then uh, we had Lula getting to prison and another protest. And um, I'm thinking here about what you said about the we and uh, about seeing the state in, in context and uh, about uh, in these cases how the Brazilian state at this point just uses these multiple voices to wash them out somehow. So I, I actually don't know how to um, tackle all these questions mm -hmm. together or how to, how to frame this about what's happening nowadays with, uh, with so many social movements in Brazil and I have many friends that were beaten up at these protests and um, participating all the time and I beaten see the up by the police, by the police yes mm -hmm. and I, I, I see the struggles and the, most of them are are working also in academia so sure. but not get, not being able to to be heard so mm -hmm. yeah what we do with that mm -hmm. also so from the outside sorry mm -hmm. so I'll take my own advice and not claim to speak say anything meaningful about the Brazilian context because I'm not an authority on that when my dear friend Sonia Correa is somebody who uh, has written and uh, published uh, very important work on what is happening in Brazil. So I can, I can only say we need to listen to voices who are, um, you know, working in the context, struggling in the context. What I can um, say from uh, a more um, kind of general common sense perspective is that uh, when um, Dilma was displaced from her position, we were all worried. And that kind of shows also the importance of having access to the state. And that, 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 that there being representatives within state organs that to a certain extent have um, progressive politics. And when the state is captured by conservative, so what I'm basically trying to do is we cannot abdicate the state as an arena for doing radical politics. I hope, I mean, if there's anything you remember from this talk, I hope that that comes across. Because I, I have, my concern is that a lot of young people find the state to be too boring. It's bureaucracy and policy. And of course, protest politics is much more exciting because that's about, you know, being, I mean, somehow this sense of powerlessness 
makes you feel like you're fighting this bad guy, you know? It's, it's the, the script of many, many Hollywood films, you know? <laughs> the poor man against the big bad, whoever villain is. And I think we need to kind of um, demystify and deconstruct this image of the state as a monster too. I mean, just take the example of uh, what happened with Trump, you know, with his, he came to power and one of the first uh, decisions he made was, you know, what was called the Muslim ban. And what happened was one organ of the state uh, acted against the other organ of the state, where, whereby the judiciary went against the executive branch. And this is where we are seeing the state as self-contradictory, inconsistent, the slippages within how the state functions. And that's what one needs to exploit. And I hope that that will be also possible in the Brazilian context. We have one last question there. Sorry to take the time, <laughs> but thanks very much for a very inspiring talk. And I was very much uh, uh, taken by your ideas of you know, your uh, polarization of those who are giving and those who are receiving, which is really linked to your idea of hospitality. And, and it reminded me of, of sort of the muscle moss and, and gift economy, the idea of you give some, something and you, this idea of reciprocity, you expect something back. Uh, and, and I found it very interesting in, in the context of the, of the migrant crisis, so-called migrant crisis in Europe at the moment, and this idea of, okay, how much do we give them and how much do we ask back? Uh, this idea of, you know, how can we integrate uh, asylum seekers or refugees to give something back to the state uh, or to civil society? And, and I wonder if you, if you have some thoughts or, or some examples maybe you could very yeah. briefly uh, yeah, yeah. sketch out. No, I was just looking at the watch because I could give you a longer answer or a shorter answer, but I'll give you a shorter answer. Um, I'm just coming from Trier, uh, where there was a huge event on the occasion of Marx's 200th birthday. And uh, it was interesting that um, uh, at the table, so they didn't have this, this uh, format, they had a table talks format. And there was somebody at my table who uh, said that, you know, so I, I kind of talked about, you know, the, the kind of money that the German state is making selling weapons in the Middle East. Yeah, billions and billions of euros, and that what was being spent on the migrants, is, on the refugees, is peanuts. So he says, no, 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 I have the figures. So the German state apparently made 4,3, uh, Germ any German speakers here in the room? Milliarden? How do you translate that into English? Billions or billions? Okay, so four comma three, and he had like really you know exact figures. Four comma three billion selling weapons in the Middle East, but spent ten billions on the refugees. And I said, how did you come up with the figures? And he said, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, all the integration courses that we have to offer the refugees, and this and that. And I said, but have you also calculated what the refugees will be paying back into the welfare state? Because who's going to be paying for your pension? when you retire, we're having a demographic crisis in Europe, there aren't enough, enough Germ uh, you know, Germans or Europeans to pay back into the pension system, so it's actually very, very convenient to have these one million new citizens who are gonna pay back into your pension systems and gonna do all the dirty jobs that you don't want to do. And then he was like, yeah, yeah, but you're you know, pushing the figures uh, by saying it'll be the same. And I had to, I, I was telling somebody, I, I, it was very convenient because I just heard this quote by Ronald Coes, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist, and he says, if you torture data long enough, you can make it to, you can, it can, you can make it to confess to anything. <laughs> so this whole thing about gift economy, how much the Europeans are giving in terms of aid, and you know, um, to the, whether it's uh, refugees at home or you know, Africa, and how they're competing with China, and they're saying, look, you know, China is terrible because they can't put any Eight con conditionalities because they themselves are human rights violators. What will they put conditionalities? But we are responsible aid givers in China because we put conditionalities like human rights violations. So this this whole question of you know who gives with what intentions and who is con who should be grateful because they are as, as a receiver or as a receiver goes to the heart of our uh, questions of um, ethics of global politics. Well, Thank you very much for your questions. It's going to be very helpful.